So I've been haunted by the memory of one of my students for the last 15 years. This student, and I'm going to call her Nicole, took one of my classes at the beginning of her sophomore year, and she did really, really well. I invited her to work with me in my laboratory because I knew that she was aspiring to pursue a PhD in cognitive psychology, and she really wanted to have some research experience. Now, Nicole had had a child while she was in high school, and unfortunately, she was estranged from her child's father, as well as from her own parents. But she had a job. She was working in my lab, and we were working on a project helping us to better understand infants' concept development. And she was planning to take a piece of that project and turn it into an honors pro project. Things were going really well. She was earning a scholarship that was helping her to pay for school. Her grandmother was helping her out with childcare. I was coaching her on the GRE preparation and helping her to get her applications ready for graduate school. She really seemed to be beating the odds that had been stacked against her early in her college career. But in her junior year, things started to unravel. In one of her core courses, she found herself struggling, and she withdrew in order to avoid failing. Because this course was really, really important for graduate school, she panicked, thinking that her dreams of pursuing a PhD were shattered. She began to smoke a lot and abuse alcohol. One night when she was driving home erratically, she was actually pulled over and charged with a DUI. She started skipping classes. She fought bitterly with her grandmother. Eventually, she dropped out of school, and of course, she didn't finish the project in my lab that I was so looking forward to working with her on. Eventually, she moved out of state, at which point she stopped responding to my attempts to communicate with her. So Nicole had had really big goals, and we both thought that she was on track to achieve them. But one failure triggered a cascade of other unfortunate consequences, and we both were powerless to stop them. And I'm haunted by this memory of her at this time because I'm now convinced that it really didn't have to be that way. I believe in focusing on small steps rather than big, huge goals. So having goals is fine but we run the risk of becoming paralyzed by the fear of failing. The American Council on Education, just a couple of months ago, published a report showing that college students in the United States are reporting higher levels of mental health concerns over the past 10 years than ever before, with staggering levels of students experiencing depression and anxiety. I worry that students often are staggering under the burden of trying to fulfill their family's hopes and dreams in a culture where a college degree is considered essential for a living wage, if not overall life success. In the state of Indiana, students are pressured to take dual credit courses, AP exams, to engage in every extracurricular activity under the sun, under the persistent threat of failing to be college ready. In my neighborhood, I've actually even met parents of preschoolers who are stressing out over which preschool to send their three and four year olds to to ensure that they're on track for college. Now, if you ask me, preschoolers should hopefully be learning to enjoy books, maybe to count, hopefully to listen to their teacher once in a while without you know, making noise all without hopefully biting each other or eating their Play-Doh. So putting pressure on parents to ensure that their four-year-olds are on track for college is silly at best. And at worst, it starts to create equity gaps between families that can afford quality preschool and families that cannot. So these incredibly high expectations that we have for our students, their parents, their teachers, all of this results in super high levels of stress. The stakes are incredibly high. 
And it's important that we do everything in our power to prepare for college applications even before we know what college is. Because we've got to pick a major and pick a career that's going to bring us success for the rest of our lives. So at every crossroads, at every point in life where it feels like we have to make a really big decision, we're threatened by the feeling of being trapped in a possible negative consequence. Some people avoid making the decision entirely. Other people, like my student Nicole, do OK in making the decision, but then absolutely fall apart when things start to go awry. Focusing on small steps is key to mental health and balance throughout the lifespan. And in human development, this is literally true. Step length increases throughout childhood. And then later in life, step length begins to decrease once again. Shorter steps help keep the center of gravity in line with the leading foot. This protects against falls, improves our stability. Shorter steps help us to pivot real quickly in the environment in response to changes. They enable us to spot obstacles and navigate smoothly around them. Shorter steps might feel less efficient than giant steps, but ultimately they're safer, they're more manageable, and they get us to where we need to go. Focusing on small steps also is a useful strategy in human problem solving. In cognitive science, oftentimes we think of a problem as literally a space between an initial state and a goal state. There are steps along the way throughout the problem. Here, these are depicted as nodes in a network. And of course, there's lots of pathways or connections or possible paths that we can take to navigate through the problem. Now, whether the problem is a complex game like chess or a complicated real world scenario like figuring out how to get ready for graduate school, the first step is to figure out how to efficiently navigate through the problem, hopefully without losing ground or getting stuck. Small steps can be thought of as sub-goals or little goals that eventually string together to help you get where you're wanting to go. And sub-goaling is a strategy that entails identifying sub-goals and then navigating across them to reach the goal state. A lot of times, the very first thing that you should do is start at the goal state and navigate backwards to identify the sub-goal. And then once you've got them, you can navigate forward from the initial state to get there. But notice that to do this, you really have to have a clear, clear goal state. You really can't solve a problem well if the goal is to make things different or help them be better than they are right now. So sometimes the really first step is to identify very clearly what the goal state is. Subgoaling depends on persistence and the discipline to continue navigating through a problem even when things get rough. When I was in graduate school and working on my PhD, I found myself in a situation that almost caused me to quit or to drop out of my problem space entirely. I had recently had a baby, and my husband had, in college, joined the Marine Reserves as a way of getting into better shape, which Sounds a little bit excessive, even now. <laughs> so he ended up getting activated and was told that he needed to report in a matter of weeks for what was later to become known as the Persian Gulf War. We were living in Atlanta. I had family really far away in Massachusetts. And I was on like this incredibly long list for university child care. So essentially, I was on my own. And I confess that working on a dissertation and all of the other tasks that are involved in completing a PhD, they seemed absolutely frivolous in comparison to worrying about my husband and rather selfishly fretting over what life was going to be like as a young widowed mother of a baby. Um, 
So, you know, I, I was in a rough place. I wallowed in this state for longer than I cared to admit. I had trouble getting to campus. I was anxious. I was depressed. I really, really had a tough time. But eventually, I decided how stupid it would be for me to quit, up, quit school at that point. I decided that I just had to suck it up. And I broke it down. I broke my dissertation down into small steps, and I forced myself to make progress towards small, manageable goals every day. I woke up and started writing while the baby was still sleeping. I outlined. I wrote a chapter at a time. I rewarded myself with M&Ms, which in hindsight wasn't healthy, but they really made me happy. <laughs> I packed my son up in his stroller and took him to school with me in order to get feedback on my writing or to attend seminars. Basically, I tried to focus every day on making a little bit of progress on the stuff that I could control. And I stopped worrying quite so much about the huge world problems that I was actually powerless to control. So in the end, I made it through that year. My husband did as well. And in hindsight, I think it really helped us to be much more resilient, both individually as well as as a couple. And it certainly helped us to appreciate much more deeply the times that we were together as a family after he came home. So when I was young, in high school, and every summer, we would go and spend about a week and a half in the mountains of New Hampshire at a camp that was called something like Run Till You Drop. Um, actually, I think it was called Run to the Top, but we thought about it as Run Till You Drop, <laughs> because that's what you did. Um, but I learned this trick at this camp that has stayed with me till this day, and we're going to share it with you, because I think it also is a very apt metaphor for this topic. So whenever you're running up a mountain, or even if you're just running up a steep hill. The trick is to never, ever, ever look at the top. Keep your gaze focused on the ground about two feet ahead of where your feet are touching the earth. Gaze down, focusing on the small steps, and you won't even know that you're running up a mountain. So full disclosure, you'll probably feel it just a little bit but it won't be nearly as bad as if you stared in the distance at the summit, consumed by dread that you were never, ever going to make it. Try this. It, it truly, truly works. So the greatest enemy of small steps is procrastination. And that's why it's really, really important to reward yourself every day for just showing up and taking a step towards a goal. If we were to collectively do this, all of us in this room, I really think that we would become far more disciplined and able to manage our time effectively. I think it would give us a sense of control, a sense of self-efficacy that would actually reduce the likelihood that we would become anxious or depressed. If we were to do this collectively, I think that we would manage at those crossroads in life to avoid being paralyzed by indecision or by fear, and we would simply chip away at the labyrinth of choices that we have before us at any given moment, hopefully making a little bit of progress every day and celebrating accomplishments when we can. So I often wish that I could talk to Nicole again at this time. Maybe she's listening to me now, or maybe she's giving this advice to her daughter. I wish that she would have known that if she simply focused on taking small steps, that she could navigate around the obstacles that seemed so insurmountable. That she could maybe stay a little bit more balanced and healthy and able to, to respond well to all the challenges that life was throwing her way. So if there's anyone here tonight, in this room right now, that's currently grappling 
with a problem that seems insurmountably daunting, I'd like you to take a breath, put your head down, and simply focus on taking one small step and then another. <laughs>